Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we praise Allah Azza wa Jal, and we send peace and blessings to all of the prophets, those who came to China, to Arabia, to India, to Russia, to Africa, to the Americas, to all of the messengers from the beginning of time, and especially the seal of the prophets and messengers, Muhammad the son of Abdullah, his family, his companions, and all those who call to his way to the day of judgment. And we begin in the greeting words of the righteous, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not speak from himself, but he spoke from above seven heavens. It is reported that he said in one of his traditions, Al ulama warathat al anbiya, that the scholars are the inheritors of the prophets, and that they did not inherit gold and silver, but they inherited knowledge. And so whoever gains this knowledge has gained a mighty treasure. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, always focused on the importance of knowledge. And we see even in the revelation itself that it is iqra. It is starting with recite, to read. And so Muslims were always involved in education, they always paid great attention to learning the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to being able to read and write Arabic, and able to record uh, their feelings and their history and um, the writings of their people. But at the same time, the great prophets and those who came before us suffered. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, also showed us that the people who suffered the most were the Anbiya. And so, the fact that a person is Muslim does not mean that they would live a life of ease. Many Muslims found themselves in a state of slavery. In the case of the Americas, it is known now that up to 30% of the people who were taken to the Americas, meaning North America, Central America, the Caribbean, and South, were Muslims. It is known today that Muslims came from all of the nations of West Africa, that from the Senangambia region came the Wolof and the Mandinka, and people who had a long tradition from the Mali Empire and from Songhai, from Nigeria, from the basin and the coastline in Benin, came the Hausa and the Fulanis and the Yoruba and the Ashanti. And so slavery struck all different nations. In Africa itself, slaves were usually prisoners of war. But in this case, a new form of slavery was being used where people became uh, like chattel. They were being sold like animals and they were not integrated into society, but they were stripped of their language, stripped of their culture, and everything that they knew was taken away from them. Despite this hardship, it is coming to the surface now in the archives of many uh, universities, also from the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. It is com coming forward that many portions of the Qur'an were written and different texts. The Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd al-Qaidawani, the great Maliki scholar, was written by slaves. And the names were written and biographies were written. So many different aspects of learning coming to the Arabic language by people who were living in a state of bondage. It is reported that in the Caribbean region, that one of the slaves named Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, that he was keeping the plantation records in the Arabic language. And a very interesting uh, report is written by him. He, he wrote about himself. And he said the following, My name is Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, born in Timbuktu and brought up in Jenne. I acquired knowledge of the Qur'an in the country of Guna, in which there are many teachers of young people. My father's name is Kara Musa Sharif. My parents' religion is Islam. They are all circumcised, and their devotions are five times a day. They fast in the month of Ramadan. They give tribute according to the law. They are married to four wives, but the fifth is an abomination to them. 
they fight for their religion. And they travel to Hejaz, meaning they make pilgrimage. They don't eat any meat except that which they kill themselves. They do not drink wine nor spirits as it, it is held as an abomination to them. They do not associate any partners with Allah. They do not profane the Lord's name. And they do not dishonor their parents. They do not commit murder or bear false witness. They are not proud and jealous and envious and boastful. For such faults are an abomination unto their religion. They are particularly careful in the education of their children and in their behavior. But I am lost to all of these advantages. Since my bondage, I have become corrupted. And I now conclude by begging Allah the Creator to lead me into the path that which is proper for me. For He alone knows the secrets of my heart and what I am in need of. Abu Bakr Siddiq, Kingston, Jamaica, September 20th, 1834. And so we find from this emotional report that the Muslims were communicating in the Arabic language. And it is said in some of the texts that a slave in Jamaica was uh, uh, writing in Arabic and he wrote a portion of the Qur'an in the Arabic language. So the slaves were literally writing in Arabic, they were uh, expressing their religion in the language, and they write in a very legible language that, that, that comes to us. We see here Laylatul Qadr, the Surah Al Qadr, and, and it is clearly written, and documents such as this uh, are coming to the surface that show um, how important Arabic was and the ability that the people had to communicate with each other and to maintain uh, uh, the texts and maintain their culture. It is also reported that women were involved in Islamic education. And uh, a Muslim woman uh, in 1860 comes into a report. It's, it's, they called her an English name. They called her Old Lizzie Gray. And she died in South Carolina. She was educated in Islam. And she claimed to be a Methodist. But she is quoted to have said, she said, Christ built the first church in Mecca. And his grave was also there. Now we can see that she's mixing things up and that is part of what happens when a person is in slavery because they're not able to really speak their minds uh, and, and to come open with um, what they believe in. But you can see from that passage that she was really saying that the first house of worship was in Mecca. She recognized the Kaaba and then uh, she also recognized that the prophets you know, were buried in uh, areas other than Jerusalem and the places of the people of the book or the Christians and the Jews. And so therefore, um, we find that Muslims, uh, scholars, are living within slavery. That great ulama were captured in West Africa and were taken to the Americas. One such scholar who found himself in a state of slavery was Ayub ibn Suleiman. He was born in Gambia and he was enslaved in Maryland. He was born around uh, 1700 AD and uh, he was taken to the Americas and he was given the name Job ben Solomon. And what was important about Ayub is um, his ability you know, to write the Arabic language and we find that he actually um, writes a number of portions of the Qur'an. He writes his biography. He is able to express himself very freely uh, using the Arabic language. And he came from a very princely family, from the Fulani. And uh, immediately when he was captured and brought to the Americas, and his writings start to come out, they recognize this is not... Uh, a regular slave who is ball and chains in a plantation. So they immediately gave him a job uh, uh, in their house and he shocked the people um, by writing in Arabic. When they expressed certain things to them, he wrote in Arabic. 
And he immediately said to his masters, he said, لا إله إلا الله, and he wrote it, and he wrote Muhammad the Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and he showed them clearly, I'm a Muslim. So they set aside a special place for him to pray, and he used to keep his five prayers, and um, he was able to fast in the month of Ramadan, and he maintained a cordial relationship. He was fortunate enough to send a letter uh, through a source coming through. He sent a letter to one of the geographical societies, and because his family was well known uh, in West Africa, it came to um, the authorities, and they paid for his freedom. And so Ayub ibn Sulaiman um, was eventually free. He traveled throughout America, and he actually uh, succeeded in impressing people throughout the United States. He also traveled uh, to England, and it is said that the Queen of England actually gave him a present, and um, he um, was sh it was a shock to people to see him writing the Arabic and to see the adab, to see the character that he had, even though he was coming out of a state of slavery. He finally reached his home uh, in Gambia, and he was involved in uh, struggling against slavery. What he would do is that he would gather his money together, and any time he heard of anybody from his clan uh, uh, and of the Muslims who was enslaved, he would purchase that person's freedom because he had suffered in the slavery period and he didn't want this to happen to other people, uh, similarly to what he had experienced. So Ayub ibn Sulaiman was a very important person and um, he leaves a, a, a trace of nobility within Islam up until today. Another important uh, personality is uh, Abdurrahman ibn Ibrahim. And uh, reports are coming about Abdurrahman that uh, he was born in Timbuktu, but he was raised in Futa Jalan in what is now present-day Guinea. And he was a warrior. He was an Amir. He was born in 1762, and he was enslaved in Mississippi. And what is important about Abdurrahman is that um, he, he struggles um, throughout uh, uh, his slavery, and he is dignified. And just his presence alone is so prince-like that they called him prince, and he became well-known within the society itself. Let's take a break for a moment and then come back to hear more about Prince uh, Abdurrahman and the other scholars in slavery. <laughs> Welcome to this new episode of Focus Point. The new generation is has the good the habit of reading more than before. Jewish question was named basically the problem of Jews who lost their function in society. One of the most important personalities from the scholars of slavery was Abdurrahman, the son of Ibrahim. He was born in the year 1762 in Timbuktu. He was raised in Futa Jalan in Guinea. And after a long ordeal in the Middle Passage, he found himself in Mississippi. Despite the